exchange, the divinely ordained exchange that took place on the cross. It was not an accident. It was deliberately planned by an intelligent God and a God who knows his creation and a God who knows to put things right. So wherever you are, whatever you are, you're going through, your answer is on the cross. And not the cross, the place Gorogoda or Calvary. It is what happened there that translates to knowledge, that translates to the rescue for you because as you understand what took place there, then you begin to appropriate what was obtained for you. And that is why we are emphasizing on this divine exchange. We are calling them divine exchange because it is what divine gave for humanity to survive. It is what humanity needed and what div divinity has for us. The moment you see that, the moment you believe it, you don't even struggle. You don't even take, need effort. It's just, just the way God created Adam, effortlessly. He put a, a bundle of dust together and he breathed his breath and the man became a living soul. He was Adam. He was alive. There was alive in him. There was Adam in him. There was life in him. And there was a personality in him. He just breathed his breath. It is as simple as that, that God eliminate the damage sin has caused in your life. Be it sicknesses, be it instability, be it fears and worries, anxiety, be it the depressions that are uh, de destroying lives, be it cancer, be it COVID-19, be it HIV, AIDS, by his breath, he answered all those questions. If I were you in the church, I could have said amen to that one. He did it. As Elder Juma was trying to remind us, it is finished. He's not waiting to solve your problem. Your problem is solved. Even if it is financial, that is manifestation. Your problem is not financial. Your problem is not social. I say it again, our challenge in Kenya is not political. It's not because we are not fighting because it's a political season. We are fighting because of what is in our heart. That is why even when we are told not to mention some names, you still go ahead and mention them. It is the heart problem. It's the heart problem. Not intelligence, not intelligence. We have quite a number of people who are brilliant in this land, and yet they can't just control what flows out of the heart because from the mouth, the heart speaks. You're only wise, you're only intelligent by what comes from your mouth. If you can't control what is in the inside, then it means you're not in control, and therefore you are not wise. Hallelujah. I have started my message, so I am continuing. <laughs> We covered two divine exchange. Number one, Jesus was punished simply so that you and I can be forgiven. And you don't need to do anything about that. Just to believe it and it happens. He took your punishment. He took your place. He exchanged your punishment for your forgiveness. You were to be, for, to be punished or you were penalized for death because of not being able to align yourself with the purposes and the will of God and expectation of God for you. So he dealt with that problem so that you don't have to be punished. Death sentence was canceled by you being forgiven. That is what we call justification. You are acquitted. You were declared not guilty. And God started to deal with you as one who is forgiven, acceptable to him because Jesus had done what God wanted to do. And I'm sure you are aware that he paid the price for you. So you don't have to be punished again. God is not in the business of punishing us for sins that he punished Christ for. Why? It was your sin, not his sin. It is our sin. And the difference is seeing that, is understanding that. It is believing that. It is appropriating that. And that is why this face of divine exchange teachings is not intended for information. It's not intended for theoretical knowledge. Not at all. You don't even need to write anything more in your notebooks. You have it. What is in there now is practical part of it. It is applying it in your personal life. Don't look at anybody else. It is you. Are you benefiting from what was paid for you? And the moment you are able to say and stand with no shadow of doubt in your mind, I know that I know that I know my sins were forgiven. 
you have got it right. Not theoretically, but knowing that I know whatever is going on in my life, it doesn't matter. But I do know one thing, my sins were forgiven. Asi tunahimizwa ama tunaele tunakumbushwa maana tushafundishwa tuwakumbushwa jinsi ya kufahamu manufaa ya uongo katika msalaba maana Kristo kachukua laana zetu kachukua dhambi zetu kachukua nafasi yetu pale msalabani ambapo alikufa kwa ajili yetu sisi tuliokuwa na hatia wanadamu waliokuwa na hatia lakini e akawa njia mbadala ye akawa patanisho ye akawa toleo la dhabihu kwa ajili na niaba yetu ili sisi tukafanyike wenye haki na kuonekana wenye haki mbele za Mungu hivi kwamba tunapoishi si kwamba tukue na hiyo elimu na ufahamu maisha ni mwetu ama kwa akili zetu lakini ni tuiweke katika vipaji vya mioyo yetu kutambua na kufahamu maisha tunayoyaishi kila kuchao na tunapoishi na kutembea ya kwamba ghadhabu iliyokuwa juu ya msalaba ama juu ya mawili wa Yesu Kristo ilikuwa ni kwa sababu yangu na wewe na hivyo ilishakamilika hatudawi tena hivyo basi yani pasa nifahamu ya kwamba ile gharama aliyoilipa kwa uponyaji nimeupokea hivyo basi kama ni magonjwa atakayokuja ya aina yoyote yanayopona na yasiyopona yameshakamilishwa pale msalabani na nimeshaponywa ni mimi nitembee nikitafakari na kujua ya kwamba uponyaji niliupo Okay, miaka elfu mbili iliyopita ni kama ni umaskini ni juu ya kwamba nilishafanywa kuwa tajiri hivyo basi ni mimi niajibike na kuamini ya kwamba huo utajiri ni wangu na ninapotembea nikiamini vitafanyika kwa sababu Kristo kafanyika suluhu la mwanadamu first divine exchange punished for us to be forgiven number two, he was wounded for our healing his wounding for our healing it was a still a divine exchange. It happened on the cross. He never was sick. He never needed to be sick, but he became sick so that we could be healed. And I think Elder Juma has done a good job to reflect on that. So as you reflect that, even when he sees that it is illegal for us to be sick, we are not undermining. We are not thinking that you are sick because you are you are naive or you do not know. We want you to know there is, a, there is a possibility for you to be without that sin or that sickness. It is illegal in the sense that it is a consequence of sin, and sin has been dealt with, and sicknesses has been dealt with. So you are not supposed to be sick if you know that there is medication, if you know there is a provision for that. You may be sick because you do not know how to appropriate it, but there, there is if they, for example, when you're sick and you don't go to see the doctor or you don't take the medicine, you remain sick. So there's no problem getting sick because that is the consequences of sin. Not necessarily your sin, but because we are living in a fallen world. We are living in a world of sin. So there are sicknesses, there are microbes, there are, there are germs everywhere now. Thank God we are no longer putting on the mask. Why were you putting on the mask? Because the germs were in the air. Isn't it? So you can get sick anytime. But that notwithstanding, there is a provision, there is a medical cover for you that protects you from getting sick and protect you from not retaining the sickness that you get. If you see what Jesus did, you can exchange it for yourself. It is how to do that we are training you. I'm not telling you to come, I pray for you to be healed. You need to heal yourself because you have the remedy. I said you have the remedy. Amen. You have been given the remedy, I have been given the remedy, and the example Juma was giving is, it's like you apply it for yourself. So that as you apply it for yourself, if it will work, it will also work for somebody else. So try the word of God. Psalms 12 says the word of God is tried seven times and it has been found to be Accurate. It is true. It is just. So if you apply the word of God as it is written, he was wounded for our transgression. Therefore, your healing is readily available. So we are encouraging us. Try to find out how does it happen? What do I need to do? What are the steps that I need to take? This is the knowledge that now I want us to have. Not that he was wounded for our healing. We have heard that a thousand times that it doesn't heal us. Now it is how does it happen? What is the process? 
What do I need to do so that I can get a headache and I deal with the headache and I don't have to see the doctor? You have option. You can go and buy a Panadol, you can go and see the doctor, or you can use the cure that God has provided for you, which is free, which is easier. I think God's method is better. The other two are good, it's okay. But if you choose to use God's method, then you need to understand how does it work for me? How does it produce what God has promised? You see, when you begin to understand the word of God, it's not just the theory, it's not just the information, it's not just the letter. The letter kills. It is the spirit that gives life. Where is the life that gives, where is the spirit that gives life? It is in the letters that is written. Why? It is embedded in the letters. It is the revelation. It's the mysteries in the letters. You have to get the revelation of that word and you apply it for yourself. Then it will give you the result. How? You need to know. How? You need to understand. How? You need to search to find out. Don't just listen, by his stripes we were healed. What does it mean? How do I apply it in my life? By his stripes, yes, you can say it, and sometimes it doesn't work. What is missing? That is what you need to find out because this uh, episode now is to prepare us to be able to find out what it is that Christ has obtained for us, and we can appropriate it. It grieves God's heart. He feels the pain that he has paid for your healing, and yet you're struggling. It doesn't please God. It doesn't please God. He says, he says it should not be so. It was not so in the beginning. And I did something concerning that. Why is it my children are not understanding that there is that provision? Why is it that we are not able to explain it? And those people who get the answer, those people who are able to see and have the power to do it, instead of educating the people to know how they need to do it, they take advantage of that again. And then we begin to have people queuing to go and see them. They don't have to go and see them. They need to tell them, you go where it was done. It was Calvary. All of us, we need to be meeting there. You hear the way the, the amen is called? We have been programmed that somebody must pray for us to be healed. It is wrong. It is wrong. Jesus never said it should be so. As his disciple, you're not supposed to be prayed for. At least if you're his disciple, you need to pray for them. Those who do not know him, that's what he meant. He taught them. He trained them. He equipped them. Then he told them, go and heal them. Not go and be prayed for. No, that will be next Sunday's message. <laughs> it just came out of the strip of the tongue. <laughs> but today we are talking about another divine exchange, that divine exchange, and it is equally important. But the area of healing, and I'm sure the Lord is going to help us to, to dig deep into it. What you need is knowledge. What you need is insight, is revelation. I've discovered it is the little key things that you need to connect to be able to apply it for yourself. And that is the most important thing. Sometimes it is, I know how you feel because I was there. I was there. And I, I was suffering and I, was, and I could hear preachers saying, by his stripes you were healed. And it's like they were preaching and they were like condemning me. It means I don't have faith. It means you don't know how to do it. And they say, I know I'm sounding the same, but I'm, I mean well for us. I'm just telling you, I have to tell you, there is a way out. It's out of compassion because I know it can work, and they also know it can work, and God knows it can work, and interestingly, even the devil knows it can work. So he tries to blinden our inner eyes of understanding. That's a key. It's not understanding even of the mind because you can understand English, you can understand the language you're talking about, but it is the inner understanding that delivers what is provided for in the word. And that is what he doesn't want any one of us to get. And some of you are already tired of my message and I'm yet to give you now the key. So before you get the key, you have slept on. How will you get it? <laughs> the third divine exchange, righteousness in place of sin. And I want to connect this one. I'm, I'm, I'm leaving that one because we will be coming back to healing again and again. I want us to get it. I want us to get it because if a tree, there will be going to be a, a distinction. Hmm? What, what can distinguish us from the world people? What can distinguish us from the people out there? They have more money than us. They are driving better cars than us. They are living in better places than us. What is it that we can claim we have and they don't have? There must be something. 
there must be something that somebody in, 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 in Runda would be looking for you in a Ushag somewhere because you have something he doesn't have. And we have it. We have it. It's only that we haven't been able to apply it and impact other people's life. Our victory is based on this third aspect of the divine exchange. And that is why I want us to go through it slowly. Because what Jesus accomplished by his perfect work on the cross, it is giving us righteousness in place of sin. And I deliberately want to go through it again. We mentioned on Sunday, but God rebuked me and told me you have, you have been shallow on that one. The details is, the, is what matters. We know that. He took away our sin and we have his righteousness. Is it applicable in our lives? Is that your experience? Is that your experience? No, it's not. Practically, it's not for many of us. So we have to be able to understand how it works so that this victory is not stolen by the enemy. And the exchange of sin and righteousness, which many people, many believers fail to grasp, it is at the root, it is the foundation of assurance. The assurance of your salvation is based on how you understand this divine exchange. And, your, uh, and the assurance of your salvation is what gives you the confidence. It is what builds your faith that can even deal with sicknesses, can deal with poverty, can deal with lack, can deal with other challenges that you're going through. But because you have built your faith and you have built your confidence and it has come as a result of knowing I am forgiven. And if I am forgiven, it's because he took away my sin and therefore I have his righteousness. Therefore, you can access God for every provision that he says it's for you. You see those details? It's what is missing. But unless we are willing to be taught, unless we develop a teachable heart, unfortunately, we will remain foreign and robe of our spiritual inheritance, which God desires us to ju just experience because he has paid it for us. First, and I want us to see this about this divine exchange, we must distinguish between sins, plural, sins with S at the end, and sin, the singular. It is sin. It is righteousness in place of sin. But there are two words. We use plural. Sins, many sins. And sins, uh, plural and many sins, or singular is sin one. <laughs> so sins in the plural, these are the sinful act we commit or we have committed. Is that too difficult to understand? Sins, there are many. Many sins that we commit. Lying, stealing, killing, adultery. Those are sins. Anger, those are sins. But then, if you distinguish it now from the main word, and the main word we are using here is sin, S-I-N. What is sin, therefore? Sin is the evil power or the evil nature that causes sins that are committed. Sin is the evil power that causes us to sin. The sins that we commit. <laughs> Maybe you can come in there. Basi anaelezea juu ya utofauti baina ya dhambi ama madhambi na sidhani kama kuna Kiswahili ambayo inasema madhambi lakini dhambi ndio hiyo anayoelezea kwamba ni nguvu inayotia tia dhambi nguvu kuweza kutuingiza katika yale maovu na dha, na madhambi ni wingi wa huo madhambi ambayo inazaliwa na hiyo Ngu, nguvu ya dhambi hivi kwamba basi tunajipata tuna tunazini tunadanganya tunafanya hayo mambo kadha wa kadha ambayo tunajua ni maovu glory to god glory to god so see the difference so that now you know you are dealing with two things you are lying is sins but there is a there is the foundation there is a root cause and this is what we are calling sin and we said sin is the evil power of evil nature. Or in other words, sin is actually is the nature, is the spirit and the nature of devil, is the spirit and the nature of the devil. You may call him sin. That could be another name you can give to the devil. But it is that element that when it's not dealt with, victory is elusive. It's not easy for you to overcome even what you're trying to overcome because until the evil power of sin has been dealt with, our deliverance is not in place. 
That is why you find good, well-intentioned believers, sound believers, mature believers, but something happened in their lives and they look for a deliverer, for somebody who, 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 who do deliverance ministry. They are sound, they are mature, they know everything, but it's like there's some disconnect. Something happening in their life they don't understand, therefore they conclude, I need to be delivered. There is no deliverance until you understand the nature of sin. Can I say that again? Until you understand the nature of sin and how to deal with it, you will remain in need of deliverance until you are 90 years old. I used to do deliverance, so I am not minimizing the, 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 the power of deliverance and the need for deliverance. But most of the things that people need deliverance for, I discovered it's because of ignorance. Hallelujah. Romans chapter 6, verse 6. That is where you find the solution for sin in terms of you requiring deliverance. What does it say? Knowing this. Do you see that? It is not somebody delivering you. Knowing this is what brings your deliverance from sin. What are you struggling with? And whatever it is, whether it is anger, whether it is bitterness, whether it's unforgiveness, there is some stubborn sin in our lives that at, at one point you feel, I need some deliverance here. Isn't it? Don't say amen, but there is. <laughs> so this is the root cause. It's the nature, and the, and the solution is there. That's what Paul is telling us. Knowing this, that our old man, this old man is the one we are calling sin, the nature of sin. The old man is the one who was crucified. And it's the nature of, it's the nature and the, of the evil power that's working in us. You see, when Adam fell into sin, nothing happened. He was the same, the same body, the same mind, the same uh, everything. He was the same. But the, he adopted another nature. And he adopted another nature by shifting obedience of, or, or loyalty. So instead of obeying God, he submitted himself to another entity. That is what has became the evil power, the evil nature. And it's the nature of the devil that makes him now to do that which is contrary to God's will. So it is knowing that that nature is what Jesus eliminated on the cross. That's what the scripture is saying. Knowing this, that the old man or the one who was controlled by the devil was crucified with the Christ. You see that? If you know that, then you appropriate your new position. He is no longer there. You are now a new creation, a new nature, and you have a new now power that is working in you that is not evil power. That is why it is the righteousness of Christ that now who have taken away or taken over from the nature that was luring your mind and luring your emotion, luring your feelings, luring your thoughts and your de decisions, so that now you see it and you see what Christ did. He took away that nature from you. That is why 2 Corinthians 5.17 is not just a good memory verse. It is a powerful declaration. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. The new does not need deliverance. The new come because it is delivered. Can somebody force themselves and say amen? amen. <laughs> the new does not need more deliverance. Why? Deliverance is part and parcel of the package of salvation. Can I say that again? Your deliverance take, took place when you received the package of salvation. The package of salvation has several elements, and we don't go to, want to go there, but the reason why we are sharing these things is so that we understand that. Salvation you received in Christ entails what? Forgiveness of sin, one. Number two, it entails what? For, eh? Healing of your sicknesses, that is salvation. Number three, it entails what? Deliverance. You were made whole by the same salvation. Your sins dealt with, your sicknesses dealt with, and your need for deliverance dealt with, so you are free from deliverance because you have salvation. Somebody could have said a bigger amen. <laughs> so it is the nature of sin that, that it is so subtle. We are not able to see it. We are not able to capture that that is what nagging us. And so we remain condemned, we remain guilty, we remain struggling, and yet it's not there. It's an illusion. It's not real. It's not real. It is in the mind. 
Why? Because your mind was programmed to sin. So whenever you sin, whatever you are feeling is the what you feel. But now the mind has to be renewed. Romans 12, 1 to 3. When your mind is renewed, especially by this scripture, it's already there, it's Romans 6, 6. When your mind is renewed with that scripture, that's one I can, I can encourage you to memorize a thousand times until it is printed in the tablet of your heart. When you wake up at the midnight and you say, knowing this, hallelujah. That's what you need to walk free and to walk knowing Christ has done it. And if he has done it, perfect, completely perfect, forever perfected, no more deliverance. Some people are saying that must be heresy. Well, for me, it is the truth. It has liberated me. The reason I was in the deliverance ministry is because at a one point in my life, I, 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 I thought I needed some deliverance. And if you want to know the first person who did deliverance over my life, it was a Filipino. Very strange. <laughs> and the very same Filipinos who were doing deliverance over my life, they were relying on me because I had some knowledge that they didn't have. The, the, the truth, some, some of the truth I was teaching them, it was about salvation. I didn't know I had the... So it is kind of ignorance that causes you to be in a bondage. In a, you are bound by not knowing. Please just try and pay me for this. <laughs> I've given you some secret nobody tells you. <laughs> you don't have to feel like you need deliverance. You are delivered. I said you are delivered. He paid it, and knowing it is all sufficient. It is either all sufficient or it is not. If I, if I believe it's all sufficient, it has to be sufficient. God is not a man that he should lie. Who must be lying? Maybe the deliverer. <laughs> but we see this in, let's go now to uh, Isaiah 53, and as you go there, maybe just break down that for us. Isaiah 53, verse 10 and 11. You see how your deliverance took place of sin and righteousness. Fahamishwa kwamba okovu umekuja na furushi ambayo iko na manufaa ndani. Na manufaa yake ndiyo msamaha wa dhambi. Manufaa yake ndiyo wakwamba kwa kupigwa mjeledi kwa kristo yesu tumepata uponyaji. Manufaa yake ni kwamba basi tumewe kwa huru. Ya kwamba kristo akachukua dhambi zetu. Sisi tukaito watakatifu. Hivyo basi tukifahamu ya kwamba warumi sita inavoto wambia. Mdani ya vipaji vietu tukue na hakikisho ya kujua ya kwamba. Mwili huwa dhambi ulisulubishwa pamoja na kristo ukaondolewa. Na basi ni tabia, um, uh, ni tabia inayotia nguvu uh, dhambi inayotufanya basi tubaki katika hayo mawazo ama fikra za kujua kwamba tuko katika dhambi lakini tafadhalini tufahamu ya kwamba dhambi zimesha ondolewa kupitia kusulubishwa msalabani na kristo. Would you say amen to that? Just believe it. Just believe it. Isaiah 53 verse 10 says, Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer and though the Lord makes his life, look at that, though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. What is Isaiah talking about? Remember, this is the prophetic dimension. He is talking about what will happen to Christ. So this is a clear prediction of Jesus' resurrection, having dealt with the sin and resurrected. See that? He will be rejoicing because of the offering of his sin when he sees his offspring and prolong his days. Why? Because he's rejoicing. The work is done. It is finished. That's why he declared so confidently. So he's, Isaiah is seeing what will happen, but now we are seeing what happened. So on the cross, Jesus was offered as, a sacri as an offering for sin. Hmm? He says there in verse 11, after he suffered, look at that, he will see the light of life. After he suffered, who suffered? Christ. So that he can see what? The, see, the, the light of life. What is the light of life? Resurrection. He was to see that his work was well done. It was a time that it was accomplished. It was, uh, it was endorsed in heaven. He accomplished what he intended. 
And this is the understanding that is more crucial for us because this is the knowledge he says there, and B, he says he will see the light of life and be satisfied by his knowledge. Look at that, by his knowledge. Then my righteous servant, and he's still talking about Jesus here, he is a suffering servant, that's what the Bible calls him in the prophecy. He is, and, and, my, and my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. You see that? What is this iniquities? We said iniquities is our rebellion. And we said it's not only our rebellion, it is our rebellion and the evil consequences of our rebellion. He bore our iniquities, our rebellion and the consequences, including sickness, including poverty, including struggle, including frustration, including curses of our lives. So when you see this, the Father made the soul of Jesus to be seen or guilty. Hallelujah. He made him an offering. It is God who made him, and he made him an offering, and the key word here is guilt. The sacrifice in the Old Testament were just a preview of what God was going to do through the sacrifice of Jesus. So the, the goats and the bulls that they were offering, they were just a preview. A person who had sinned was required to bring a certain sacrifice, a goat or a bull, and maybe present it to the priest as appropriate according to the size of your sin. <laughs> and when you do that, then you come and identify the goat that you have brought. You put your hands on your goat. That is very important because nobody can, can get your exchange. It is you. Your goat, you must come and identify, this is mine. What you need to do, you lay your hands on the goat. What are you doing? You are transferring your sin on the goat. Divine exchange that took place on the cross. This was the type of the divine exchange. When you put your hands on the cross and you say, I have transferred my sin on the cross. I have transferred my sin on the goat. I have transferred my sin on Jesus. Therefore, your sins are literally taken away from you and they are carried by the goat. So when the goat is being killed, it is being killed by you because of the sin that the man had committed, not because of the sin had committed. The, the goat had committed any sin. The goat was innocent but you transferred your sin. If it was not innocent, they could not have eaten. <laughs> Is that correct? The priest was supposed to eat from that goat. So it was not sin, it was symbolic, just transferring their sin, and it was working for them. But incidentally, it was only working for a period of time. Why? Because the blood of goats and bulls could never, could never take away sins. And Hebrews 8 to 9, 26. But this man, when he had come, he offered once and for all a sacrifice that takes away the sins of the world. Did you see that? The blood of goats and bulls could never, has never, will never take away sins. But when this man, this Christ, this our high priest in the order of Melchizedek, he laid his life on the cross. He did it once and for all all sufficient, all perfect, all complete sacrifice. Once and for all, he took away the sins of the world. That is why John was saying in John uh, 1, 29, behold the Lamb of God who takes away, who takes away, not just cover. He's not just transferring. He takes away the sins of the world. So what happened on the cross, it was symbolic of what was happening in the Old Testament, what was happening to the animal. And the an animal was killed. And in a sense, it was paying the penalty for your sin. Jesus was killed. And in the sense, he was paying the penalty for your sin. Simply just believe it. You can do nothing against the truth, but believe the truth. That is the truth that set us free. And all this is a picture of what has happened on the cross. And as you come to believe it, and as you come into terms to it, you begin to see that God made his soul. God made Jesus' soul an offering for sin. God made Jesus' soul, not his body, his soul. Why? The life of the flesh is in the blood. And that is why he was made sin in his soul, so that your sin is not just carried by him. On the, he didn't put them on the shoulder. When he says he himself carried our sins, he didn't put them on the shoulder. He carried them in his heart. He was suffering the consequences of sin. It was real. 
This is a very powerful, amazing statement. He, he, it's like he, 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 he made his soul, not his body. It is his soul that was an offering for sin. And the moment you see that, you begin to value that sacrifice. It was not just the wounding of the body. It is the wounding of the soul. Why? Because what Jesus did, he was taking away our sinfulness. He was sinless, but he was taking away our sinfulness and the pain that goes along with our sinfulness and the guilt that goes along with our sinfulness. You and I know when you have seen the guilty burden that you have. How you feel is the way he was feeling because he was carrying the burden of guilt for humanity. It was heavy weight. That is why he was agonizing on the cross. That weight was just too much. His soul was loaded with the iniquities of billions of Chinese. That is too much. But then he was there bearing, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they have done to me. That's why he was crying out. That's why he was crying out. He had even a deal with God, and he said, I will still go. If it is your will, I will still go to the cross. But finally, when he landed there, uh, uh, that's why he was saying, Aloy, Aloy, Alambas Kabidani, why have you abandoned me? He couldn't help it. It was painful. Why? It was weighty. His soul was groaning within him. He was bearing my sin. When I see this, the more I celebrate salvation. When I see this, and the more I celebrate my deliverance. The more I see this, the more I celebrate the perfect sacrifice. Amen. It can't be, have we? You can't demean that sacrifice. That is why the Bible is saying here, he himself, when he sees his offspring rejoicing, that's what makes his life better. He, it's, not, it's not our mourning. It is when we celebrate, he says, he will see his offspring and he will prolong his day. Why? He will, the, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. Why? He can see you rejoicing because he agonized for you. But when he sees you agonizing and he agonized, he is wondering, why did I have to go through that? And you're still going through it. It is wrong, it is unfair for him. So what is the best thing? Get to know, he will justify many because he volunteered to go through for us. So we normally feel a sense of shame, an embarrassment when you have committed some sin, isn't it? Even when nobody knows, you feel the guilty and you feel the embarrassment and you're hating yourself, how could I do that? How, how can I, how, how, how did I go to that website again? <laughs> Sorry for using that. Those memories that nags us, it is the guilty burden. And it's what he says, now he bore, he bare their iniquities. He carried those iniquities. The, 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 those, those consequences, you don't have to go through it. And I want us to look at that aspect of our guilt because that is what he dealt with primarily. And we can only do that if we understand what he did on the cross. That is why Jesus took upon himself on the cross our sins. And the scripture Elder was quoting is, is actually now, it is a quote from Isaiah, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 21. He made him sin, he who knew no sin, and put his sin in his soul, weighty. He put his sin on his soul so that we can become the righteousness of God through his righteousness. Divine exchange. Can you deny it? It's there. It's there. And he says there, he was, you see, 2 Corinthians is actually quoting Isaiah 53 verse 10. The one we're quoting there. It is, a, it, it is just a quotation from there. And that is what exactly what happened. Because what is the opposite of sinfulness? In one word, it is righteousness. How are we justified? Declared not guilty and declared righteous. What does that mean? Clothed with God's righteousness. How does that happen? It has to be divine exchange. God takes away your sin and he gives you Jesus' righteousness. It is as simple as that. And that is the staggering thought that you need to believe and utterly believe it and stand by it. He was made sin so that I am no longer sin. The moment I saw that light again as a believer, I ceased to struggle with the sin for ever. I did. I saw the light. It is the light that enlightened you and you realize, ah, the sin burden, the guilt burden was sorted out. So I'm no longer a victim. I am no longer the one on the receiving end. Jesus did it for me, did it for us, and he attained a righteousness of God. 
which is total. So you cannot attain any more righteousness by trying to be more righteous by coming to church. For heaven's sake, by the way, if you try to get more righteousness when you come to church, you realize it is more unrighteousness you incur. Have you ever noted that? The more you commit yourself and you say, I'm going to try to be more righteous. Have you done that? Even by fasting and prayer and some time, that you want to feel some more righteousness. Forget it. The more you feel unrighteous. It is knowing this. It is knowledge that deal with that burden of guilt that come. Because we are living in a fallen world and sin is everywhere. So it is knowing how to deal with the sin when it comes on you that makes the difference. It's not you trying some effort to be righteous by yourself. I don't know whether I'm saying too much. Just break it down for us and I go to the last phase. Nasi Kristo kufanyika dhambi kwa niaba yetu ili tukafanya kuwa watakatifu. Tutunambiwa katika mungu kunayo majira na, 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 na nyakati. Na wakati ule ambao ulikuwa ni wakati wa, za, wa, wa kale, tunambiwa kulikuwa na kivuli ambacho kilikuwa kinatumika kwa ikuashiria kristo kuja ili ku, kuweza kufilia dhambi. Na ndiposa basi nyakati zile mtu angetenda dhambi, ilibidi basi kama ni dhabihu ambayo ingekuwa ni mbuzi, ingekuwa ni ngombe, ingekuwa ni kuku, itolewe kadri na kiwango cha dhambi ya zile mtu ametenda naye basi ataenda pale na kuweka mikono juu ya hiyo dhabihu ili basi akapate kubadilishwa dhambi zake zikaingie kwa huo mnyama naye akapate kuondoka akapate kuwekwa kwa huru lakini dhabihu hiyo ilionekana kwamba haikufaa kwa sababu ilikuwa haiondoi dhambi na ku ondoa mawazo kama mwanadamu kuwa dhambi imetolewa bali iliacha hukumu na ghadhabu basi katika basi majira haya ya neema tukampewa Kristo ambaye alibeba ghadhabu na hukumu zetu katika nafsi yake kupitia uchungu msalabani ili basi kwa kumwaga damu yake mara moja na milele na daima tukapata kufanywa haki milele na tunapoendelea kufahamu hiyo basi tunapojikuta kwamba tuko katika hali ya dhambi tuko katika hali ya kuhukumu tuko katika hali ya kukwazika tufahamu ya kwamba neno hili uh, uh, maandiko haya yamewekwa vipajini vya mioyo yetu ya kwamba dhabihu hii ilitolewa ni kamilifu na haitarudiwa tena basi ni mimi nifahamu ya kwamba nilifanywa kuwa haki hivyo basi nasimama nikiwa haki nikitembea nikijua ni kwa sababu ya Kristo nimefanywa kuwa haki hivyo siko chini ya hukumu tena bali nitembee katika nuru na katika basi roho maana sidumu katika huu mwili wa kale ambao li Amen. Would you like to say amen to that? You, when, I, when I ask you to say amen, I'm telling you there is some emphasis there. You need to put it to yourself. I say amen to that one. I receive that one. I appropriate that one. That what happened there is not my effort. It's not what I do. It is simply you cannot apprehend that righteousness by anything other, any other means. Only one means available for us. That is faith. It sounds simple, but it is what it takes. It's your faith alone that can attain the righteousness you are looking for. And when your faith is in place, then you are able to appropriate that righteousness that was obtained for you because it's the only way that God has made it for us. So we have to believe. We have to force ourselves to believe, even the unbelievable, that Jesus was made sin. If you make yourself to believe, then... Isaiah 61 became, becomes now yeah, another insight for you that you can actually celebrate. He says there in Isaiah 61, verse 10. Sorry, Jude, I didn't prepare you, but it's there. 61, verse 10 says, I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God, for he has clothed me with the garment of salvation and arrayed me in a robe of his righteousness. I'm trying to explain how do we get this righteousness. And you can see it is all God's doing. He first of all takes the garment of salvation and gives you. He goes ahead and decorates the garment of salvation and gives you the robe of righteousness. See, it's an exchange. He took away your sins. And he did it there, what we saw there. It was the exchange that took place there. And, it's the, and it, is, it reveals the beauty of that exchange. That what happened there was as an exchange. He took away your few the garment of sin. Picture that. He took away the few the garment of sin. You came to Calvary. You came to Calvary with the garment of filthiness, sin, unbelief, adultery, wickedness, murder, some of them. But then he took away the few the, the, the garment and he 
clothed you with the garment of salvation. And then he beautified it or he, he, he decorated it with the robe of righteousness. You can see that exchange. It is literal. That's what this scripture is talking about. I delight greatly. When I saw what he did, I delight greatly that I left the garment of sin down there at the cavalry. And I went home with a new garment of salvation, with a new robe of righteousness. And people were looking, where did you buy that one? No, I was given. Did you see that? You go out there in tatters, then somebody shows mercy on you, remove your tatters, and put you with a, on a new, on a blood new uh, dress or something. When you go home, don't you think you look smart? But you can make a mistake and say, I bought it. No, you didn't buy, you were given. But nature of man is, ah, oh, this one I bought in Nuchumi. But you know you are given. <laughs> That's why sometimes we behave like our salvation we have, it, we have worked for it. It's not because we have fasted that we have the salvation. It's not because we pray too much we have salvation. It's not because you come to church we have salvation. It is a gift. And a gift that has cost somebody something. So that dress you go dressing on, it costs somebody something. But for you it is not a, a wage. It is what? It's a gift. So you celebrate, ah, somebody showed mercy on me. That's what God wants from us. Somebody just, somebody just felt mercy on me and bought me this one. That is what you need to do for salvation. Every single day, we need to be thankful for, to God for our salvation. The garment we never paid. It is wonderful. These are the good news. Can we pause there and just lift up your hand and say, I thank you for the garment of salvation. I thank you for the robe of righteousness. I thank you because it was free. You did it. You bought for me. You exchanged my field, the garment. I receive your robe and I believe it is mine. That is what it takes. I asked you to do that because I have realized saying amen is not working. Hallelujah. That one I think is working. <laughs> so you are not only saved from sin, but also... You have been robed with the righteousness of Christ. Covered with the righteousness of Christ. How does it mean? He has justified you. You see that? He said that the servant will suffer so that he can justify many. What is to justify? Is to make righteous. Is to declare righteous. Is to acquit from guilt. Is to release you from the burden and the penalty of sin. That is justification. How did it happen? On the cross. It was a judicial function. God saw what happened there on the cross. Jesus agonizing and he said, I justify that one who believed that act. I declare that one just because he simply agonized with the Christ on the cross. That is why when you see the cross, when you begin to carry the cross as a disciple, it is because you have seen the value of the cross. And that's why it's not a big deal. If you want to be my disciple, value what I did for you on the cross. You will surely carry the cross anywhere, anytime, any place. Supposing you are being tried in the Supreme Court for a crime that carries a penalty of death, and finally the judge comes and is giving the verdict, and he says, after perusing all the evidence given in this court, I find you not guilty. How would you feel? Would you go home saying, the judge did not find any fault in my life, and you know you are guilty? Would you go carelessly saying, I'm guilty, I'm free now? See the expression, I delight, I delight greatly in the Lord of what he has done. You will go home celebrating. If you have never embraced your wife in public, you will embrace her that day. I'm saying this to make a point home. <laughs> Why? It, be, it is excitement. You are celebrating something you knew. The judge will surely say, I find the accused guilty. What is the next step? And I sentence him live in jail. That's what the person was expecting. Unfortunately, the judge was out of his mind. I find no evidence over this case, and therefore I declare you not guilty. What does that mean? You are Acquitted. What does that mean? Just go home and have a dinner with your wife. That's what happened for Barabbas at the cross. He was waiting to hang. Then he had somebody else is hanging on your cross, on your, on your behalf. So you need to go home fast before they change their mind. Woo, glory to God. Divine exchange. Somebody say, divine exchange. 
It is weighty. It's not just a, 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 a phrase. It's not just a, a terminology. No, this is not, it's not a jargon. Divine exchange. Say it again with the faith. Divine exchange. Some people don't have faith. One, two, we go. Divine exchange. I see it. If you didn't say, I see it, you have not seen it. Believe you me. I'll give you another chance by the time we are closing, so get ready. <laughs> it takes that deep, weighty conviction. This is what happened. It can be anything else other than divine exchange. And as you see it and you embrace it, then you know I am justified just like I have never sinned before. That clarity comes when you embrace the weight of the statement, I am justified. And it makes it real for us when we apply it forcefully the way I'm asking us to do. So that it doesn't bother us. And this is what I'm saying so that as I close, ability to keep this position that you have in Christ is what you need. What do you need that? is the skills, is the ability. This is the last point, just note it. Guarding against guilt. Guarding against guilt. Being empowered against guilt. If you know how to guard yourself against guilt, because your position in Christ is certain, it is settled, but guilt will come. Why? Because this is the devil's primary weapon against human being, and more so against believers. The greatest weapon the enemy uses against us is not even sicknesses and diseases. It is guilt. Before you are helpless to pray for your sickness, do you know what is bothering you? It is guilt. You are feeling guilty so that you think, I don't have faith, I don't have confidence. God will not hear me. Are you praying for God and nothing is happening? Why are you not getting answers from God? Because you are guilty. God is not answering because now I know because of that sin, because of that sin I have never repented. It's not true. It's not true. If God was to wait for you to repent fully, you couldn't have received anything up to now. There are so many things that are pending, you have not sorted God out, so it's not true. It is guilt that makes us to have barrier between us and God. Not primarily sin. Sin has been dealt with, especially if you are a child of God. But I want you to see this. What happens here? We must be very careful, especially for anyone who makes you to feel guilty. Even if you're a preacher, if they're making you feel guilty, there's something wrong. You're not supposed to feel guilty even when you have done sin. The correct thing is what the Holy Spirit does. In John chapter 16, verse 8, the Bible says the Spirit of God convict the world of sin, not guilt. The Spirit of God will convict you of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Conviction and guilt are two different worlds altogether. So what we normally deal with is not conviction. Why? Because conviction has a solution. Guilt has no solution. Many of us are struggling because of guilt. And at the day and the moment you see that, what is the difference between guilt and conviction or whatever, whatever it is? Whatever. When, when you are convicted, what happened? The Holy Spirit convicts the world, not even the, the, the church, but he does the same. He can convict us, but not make us to feel guilty. What does that mean when the Holy Spirit convicts you? He says to you, you did this and it is wrong. You see that? The Holy Spirit is gentle. The Holy Spirit is not condemning. The Holy Spirit shows the light. He says, this was wrong. And then he tells you, by the way, there's a provision, you can correct it. So he's not condemning you. He's only helping you to know there is something that you need to deal with so that you remove the barrier between you and God. So your sin is not a problem. It is how you deal with it. And this is the issue. You feel guilty because you have sinned, yes. But the Holy Spirit comes and tells you, you did this and it is wrong. So you need to, rep to repent and put things right. It's as simple as that. Whatever it is, you just need to repent, then it's over. 
If we confess our sins, First John chapter 1, verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us from all our unrighteousness. What does that mean? When he forgives us from all our unrighteousness, you return to your position just like you had not sinned. What do you need? Just acknowledge what the Holy Spirit is convicting you. But when the devil comes, he makes you to feel guilty and he makes you to be sure. Even if you do what, God will not hear your prayer. So he leaves you wounded. You don't even know what to do with your sin. Why? You are dealing with the guilt. Guilt never goes away. But the only way you can deal with the guilt is deal with the sin. Immediately you commit that sin, repent and turn away from it and allow the righteousness of God to be restored and then you are in fellowship with God one more time. The devil doesn't want us to enjoy that. That is why he keeps on keeping, bringing thoughts again. So when somebody is guilty or you have done something wrong to somebody, and you repent, and you ask them for forgiveness, and they don't want to let go, you better leave those, that person alone. Don't go carrying guilt. If you have wronged somebody, and you have repented, and they don't want to forgive you, forget them. Somebody doesn't want to take that home. <laughs> so the Holy Spirit convicts you. He shows you what to do, and as you do it, guilt cannot be your portion. So you stand by God's promises from that point on. Why? If I confess my sin, if I confess my sin, if I confess my sin, he is faithful, he is faithful, he is just, he cannot deny himself. He will do what he has said he will do. What is that? He will forgive me my sins. Has he forgiven me? Definitely he has forgiven me. I go back to the original position. Where was the position? I am forgiven at Calvary. You remain there as long as you deal with the sin as they come. The problem with many of us, and you want to hear this, you have so many sins that are accumulating in your life, you have not dealt with them. So the burden of guilt is heavy on you and it is crushing you down. So the best thing is, deal with them as they come. The ones you don't know, just tell God, forgive me the, the secret errors, forgive me the presumption, sin, Psalms 19, even the sin that you do not know you have committed, just ask God, forgive me. James 2, the last verse says, if you, if you know what is to right and you don't do it, it is sin. Even that one you know it is right and you did not do it because you didn't know what you didn't do, just tell God, even that one I don't know, forgive me tonight. Just sleep with, at peace with God. Some of you spend one, one whole week and you have never told God, I'm sorry. I'm telling you, that's why the, build, the duty burden is too heavy on you. Those sins are accumulating. And I'm going to show you the problem now. Why? Because we have an accuser. We have an accuser who goes before the throne room of God to accuse us daily of our sins. So if you don't deal with it, there's somebody else who is smarter than you. Hallelujah. Why is that? It's because we have not dealt with it. But we have to do with it. And I, I, I want you to, to see this because this is very good and very powerful for us. How do we deal with guilt? Simply repent. Genuine repentance. Not repetition, repentance. By the way, here we don't do a lot of repentance because I expect you to be smart. I expect you to be mature. I expect you to be original. I expect you to be sincere. You will deal with the sin as it come. Hallelujah. Repeating it here will be just a religious light. It is at home that you need to put things right. When you are still in God and telling God, you are reviewing your life. You are doing, a, 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 what is that? You are looking over your life. What, is, what needs to be put right here? That's the only time you can do genuine, sincere, authentic repentance. This other one is religion. But repentance is crucial in your life. And one of the ways even that repentance works better is what he says in John chapter 1, verse 7. He says, if we claim to be in fellowship with God and we are walking in darkness or we are walking in sin, we are a liar. You are a liar and the truth is not in us. But look at it, verse 8. What does the Bible say there before verse 9? He says, but if, look at that, if we walk in the light, if we walk in the light. Do you have that scripture there? If we walk in the light as he is in the light, then automatically the blood of Jesus purifies us. 
That's another way of dealing with your sin. It is to make sure I am walking in the light. Avoiding sin. Avoiding corruption. Just walk in the light. It's walking in the light, the truth that you know. And as you walk in the light and you remain in fellowship with one another, then the blood of Jesus continually purifies us. But just in case that there were some sins that I was left out, then you come and say, confess that sin that you feel is bringing guilt to you. Or which one that you feel you're not sure whether you did it or not. So it is not your righteousness, but God's righteousness. But how do you retain it? How do you maintain it? It's keeping the devil away from you. Hallelujah. How do you do that? It is when he accuses you of things that you have done, you need to respond. Hallelujah. How do you respond? Isaiah 54. Isaiah 54, verse 17. When you have done what you need to do, then you know you are now equipped. What does the Bible say in Isaiah 15, uh, 54 verse 17? There is no weapon forged against you, but you don't believe it, let me put myself there. There is no weapon forged against me will prevail. And I will refute every tongue that accuses me. Hallelujah. Why? This is the heritage. This is the inheritance of the servant, and I am a servant of the Lord. And this is the vindication from me, from God, declares the Lord. So when the enemy accuses you of guilt and sin, and you know you have done what you need to do, you use the weapon that has been given here. Hallelujah. So you don't have to carry guilt because there is provision for dealing with your guilt. And that is beautiful. So what you, what you need to know is guilt is not supposed to be left unattended. How do you do that? You react to it. I told you the devil accuses us. I hope I'll get that scripture right. Revelation 12. Revelation 12 or 11 or whatever it is, I'm not sure, but you might get it there. Ah, the devil is a liar. It's, I'm just there and I can't see it. You see, he didn't want you to see it. I'm looking at it here. It's here and I can't see it. Hmm? What could it be? It's only that the devil doesn't want you to know because this is what is happening to you whenever you feel guilty. Look at what it says in verse 10 of Revelation 12. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah for the accuser, for the accuser of our brothers and sisters. You see, we have an accuser. Where is this? It is in heaven. It's the court of heaven. Every day there is transaction. There is judicial transaction that takes place. The scripture that Elder was quoting, the devil was in heaven when he was talking with God about Job. What had he gone there to do? He had gone to prove to God that Job need to be punished. Did he prove to him? Yes. He told him he doesn't sin because you have put a hedge around him. How did he know God had put a hedge around Job? He had watched over his life. You have a hedge around you, but the moment you break that hedge, the enemy comes in and go to heaven and say, you see the one you put the hedge, he broke the hedge, and now he is suffering because of this. He is an accuser. He is false. What does the Bible say? He is roaming. He is moving, walking to and fro, seeking whom he may devour. What does it mean to devour? He has to accuse you to God, and he asks for permission to chastise you. You see that? That is what is happening here. The accuser of our brothers who accuses them from before our God day and night has been hurled down. Now, this is a future. It will happen in the future. It has not happened. As much as he was hollowed down, he is here now. But it, he's, now he's still accusing us daily. 
But now he's talking about prophetic dimension here. Then he says in verse 11, but they triumph over him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Now, what does it mean? When the devil accuses you of guilt that you have brought to the blood of the lamb, if you have repented and you have sorted out things, this is a scripture that you use. How do you use it? You testify by the speakings of the blood. And the blood speak on your behalf if you have repented. If you have not repented, the blood does not speak on your behalf. Jesus is our attorney. He is our advocate. But he waits for you to repent so that he says, Father, even that one, I shed his blood for, me, for him because he has brought the blood on board. So what you need is to, to use the blood. And this is where the, the mess has come. We have come up with this. We have misused the blood of Christ very badly. Very badly. The way you use the blood of Jesus is not pleading the blood. It is allowing the blood to speak on your behalf and you positioning yourself on where the blood has put you. Where has the blood put you? Walking in the light as he is in the light. Don't mess up and you begin pleading the blood. No, it doesn't work. The blood only speaks for you when you identify yourself with the blood. Why? They overcame him. They triumphed over the accusation of the enemy by the speakings of the blood. Why? Jesus is our advocate and he makes intercession for us on a daily basis. How does he do that? He presented his blood and his blood is speaking in heaven today. His blood is speaking the author of heaven today. He's speaking better things than the blood of Abel, which was speaking for judgment. The blood of Jesus speaks for forgiveness. So when you say, I activate the speaking of the blood of Jesus over my life, it is better than pleading the blood. Pleading, where did you find that in the Bible? It's not there, I found it. It is the speakings of the blood. It is applying that blood that makes intercession for you, and then you are acquitted. That's why we are saying here, the weapon of silencing the accuser can only happen when the blood is speaking on your behalf. There are two people in heaven, the devil who is accusing you, and there is Jesus in heaven who is your advocate. So when the devil says he has done this, that Jesus come and say, yes, sir, he has done it, but because of the speaking of my blood, that one, I am his attorney. Hallelujah. That's what the lawyer do for you in the court. If you have been in court, when you, when you, when you engage a lawyer, you are told, don't say anything. Isn't it? <laughs> you, allow, you allow the lawyer to speak, on your behalf. What does that mean? It is the blood that speak on your behalf, not your shouting and your loud mouth. Some of us, we speak more than Jesus to God. We don't see even the need to engage the blood when you're going to God. We are going direct like he is our... <laughs> uh -uh. It's the blood that testify on your behalf up there. How do you do that? When you have any issue, come to Christ. Come via the blood. Come via the sacrifice. Come via the one who took away your sin. And you say, this is what has happened, and the blood of Jesus purifies us. Without that process, you remain in the guilt. How does it happen? Engage the blood. So when you want the blood to work for you, instead of pleading, engage the speakings of the blood. How do you do that? Engage the sacrifice of Christ. That is the total sacrifice. We have redemption by the blood of Jesus. We have forgiveness by the blood of Jesus. We have righteousness by the blood of Jesus. How does that happen? By the speakings of the blood. Why? That's why the Bible says, you remember when Jesus rose from the dead? He told Mary, don't touch me. I have to go and finish the transaction. Why was he going to heaven? It's to present that blood. It's still there. And it is speaking better things for you and for me. So when you feel guilty, allow the blood to speak on your behalf. And when you know this, this is the truth that separates us, that makes us to be free, that we begin to align ourselves with the scripture, and we are able to say in Romans 8, 1, there is therefore no condemnation in my heart when I know that the blood is speaking on my behalf. Powerful liberation. Why are we allowing the enemy to torment us? It's because we do not know. So as you see this, begin to believe it was concluded. Are you struggling with the guilt? This is the solution. 
Silence the voice of the enemy. Silence the voice of the accuser. How do you silence the voice of the accuser? Do you know you are not your enemy? You are not the devil's mate? You cannot measure to the, to the power of the devil, by the way. As much as we, we, we rubbish him, he has more power than us. Being human, the devil has more power than us. Believe it or not. He does. It's only when you come in the authority of the blood. That's the only way you can defeat him. That's what the Bible is saying there. They overcame him, the accuser, by what? By the blood. No shouting at the devil. <laughs> Some of us believe that shouting more to the devil, they say, it doesn't change, it doesn't move him. Especially when he knows you don't even know the mechanics of the blood. He doesn't care. You shout as much as you can. But the moment you know the power, and the, the lawyer told, tells you, don't say anything to this man. Just hand over to me. I'll deal with him in the court. The devil is a prosecutor. Did you know that? The best prosecutor <laughs> who prosecute the whole world, and I'm sure he's prosecuting Putin, the Russian man. He is good at that. But primarily, he uses guilt. That's why you and I get affected. We are exempted because we are not guilty. In the court of heaven, we are not guilty. But when the devil finds room to go there and accuse us, and he is articulate, and he doesn't present cases that are going to fail, you better, you better have a good, qualified lawyer. Is that correct? If you commit murder and you are going to court, you better have a qualified lawyer who can argue your case that is it. If you commit sin, you better have a good, well-qualified advocate. Thank God we have one. Thank God we have one. First John chapter 2, verse 2. He is our advocate. When we sin, he advocate, he present our case before the court of heaven. Why? He paid the price. So he doesn't want to see that price lavished by any sin. If you agree with him, walk in the light, he washes you. How does that happen? The speaking of his blood is allowed to speak on your behalf. Why? You're walking in the light. As you walk in fellowship with one another, we allow him to defend us. As you walk according to the light of the word of God, we allow him to defend us. Who is it who can condemn? Romans chapter 8 verse 34. Who is it who can condemn? It is he who justifies. Where is he? Seated at the right hand of the supreme judge. That is where he is located. Your lawyer does not, doesn't need to be called from far. He is seated at the right hand of the judge. And whenever there is an accusation, he knows where the people he represents. If he represents you, you are safe. Hallelujah. I think I will end there. Because as a good lawyer, I have made my case. <laughs> are you able to summarize that?